Reggaeville family, thank you so much for tuning in to Take Me Places, uh, a show that highlights veterans, members of the reggae fraternity that have been in this for so long, have a history to tell and that take us to special places that are very important to them. And today I've been taken and invited to a place by no other than I want to say the most recorded <laughs> drummer in Jamaica, a man who has shaped the music uh, for decades, always left his trademark, producer, drummer. I mean, sir, you're on countless records, yeah. even on, on some that you are not credited for. That's you know? true, yeah. <laughs> With me is the great, amazing Sly Dunbar. It's great Thank to be here doing this interview with you. Thank you so much. Yeah, man, enough respect. Enough respect, same way. I'm very, very happy and excited. And yeah. Yeah, just just very glad to see you. Um, please tell us, where did you invite me to? Oh, uh, I invite you here. This is the little studio that we have on Riddles Road, and I figure more or less we will be more comfortable here going, instead of going somewhere else to do it. So I said, let her come here, we can do the interview here. So uh, we're here every day, everybody like family. So nice. That's why. So this is where you usually go every day? Every to day. Work? Yeah, like, if I don't get booked to one of the studios, maybe Anchor or Mix and I'm okay. always there because we're always working making new music, you know? Exactly, exactly. And we are in Kingston, you mentioned we are King, now we are in Kingston, Road. Road. Road, Kingston, Jamaica. Exactly. Not too, too far from here um, is also Waterhouse, the community. Waterhouse, Waterhouse is well, where right? I grew up in. It's, it's like not too far from here still. So like, I mean, maybe, if there's no tropical road, maybe 15 minutes driving in a car going down, down there, you know? Tell me a bit about growing up in Waterhouse. How was the community well, like at that well, time? Well, I was born um, in, um, in um, on Winter Road, Road. This is East of Jamaica, 2G Winter Road. And, uh, I don't remember what age I came to Waterhouse, but I came very young. So when I came there, I mean, the first time I ever saw a cow, I didn't stay in my life, you know, because <laughs> I, I didn't remember when my father and I went to the store to get something to, to buy to eat, and we walked up there. It was a little bit dark, I mean, there was a lot of light on the road, but the play everywhere was kind of safe, you know. But growing up in Waterhouse, and um, you see, you become friends with a lot of people around you and everything like that. And you know, that, to me, it was a nice community, and I learned a lot from living in Water because um, everybody in Waterhouse used to have like a little system set up that they can play music. As we go to the tailor shop, they play music in the tailor shop. The book on Tubby's. King Thomas was from the era. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people used to build amplifier and they may build an amplifier, they need a record to play. So everybody would be playing the record and then they used to go to Studio One and buy all these pre release records. And then so I had some of the songs I knew from a, a longer time because there was a friend of mine the name of Ricky used to build amplifier and he used to go and buy the record. And I used to play the record when he was fixing the amplifier to get the flip side. And I've seen a lot of songs that it's just been a hit now and it came up like maybe 50 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned that music was par part of your life at that age yeah, already. Yeah, yeah. Before, also, before yeah. that, yeah, because my mother, uh, we saw her at the airport and my father, and you know, when when she would come and tell me that Shirley and Lee are these foreign artists coming into the because she saw them at the airport. And she loved music very much because she told me about Arabella Fante going to school in Jamaica and experience were Jamaican. And, and I remember she had a book on, on Louis Armstrong, you know. And I remember she gave it to me and I was reading his life story and everything like that. So she really loved her music very much. Because I remember when I was 10 years old, um, I used to go to station on my own. She used to send me, I remember I went to watch his cat lights. And she used to send me just by myself, you know. And she was never worried? No, she was never worried. I mean, she was, I think, very supportive of your music, musical yeah, career in general. Yeah, right? because when, I, when I, I, I left school 
and told her about one summer. I didn't want to go to school, I wanted to do music and I wanted to paint and to play and she said, okay. Uh, some of my friends were going back to KC. I didn't want to go to KC because I used to go to Trenchstone Conference of Life from the primary school to the high school. So I see all the stars. I would walk down when I see Delroy with Sevilla. So I was in this groove because Trenchstone was the happening place for the music. So I, 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 I feel good to know that I stay at Trenchstone and then I decided to leave. We had asked Ken Boo to come and perform at the school at the end of the, the, the summer, beginning the summer holiday, and he came and performed. And he had this big song, uh, Pop It on the String. And when Ken Boo sang, you know, I said, Boy, really, I don't want to go back to school. This is music, you know. So my mom had to say, Okay, and I don't know if she got a dream or something, but I shouldn't be telling her that, you know. And she said, Okay, no problem, man. Light parts. Who used to be a singer you know, in a group called the Termites. He used to sing a student one. He would come with his guitar every day because there was a big tape recorder that a friend of ours had left at my home. So he used to use the tape recorder to light across, would come and would play. And I would tap on the tape cover like a real drum. And that was singing. And you could listen back to his song that he was writing and everything. So, Light Box is one that kind of tuned to me. And then, Auntie Collins now is the one that took me to the studio at 14 years old to play my first recording. And you were 14 Yeah, that I played time. Um, on a song called Night Doctor. It came out as the Upsetters. Yeah. And then in the same year before I even reached a 15 year old, I played Dog Bar, which was a million seller for Exactly, Collins, number so one person. hit. For those two people, like uh, the, my backbone coming up to where I am today, they were responsible for everything. I mean, you, you said 14 years old. Did Ansel ever tell you what he saw in you, that he had the confidence well, that you were I remember this? I was playing in this band called um, Yard Rooms, and then I went down here to look for a friend of mine, Ranchi, who was playing guitar on the Archie Invincible Band. There's a band that Ansel used to play, and then the great drummer by the name of Tinley was playing in that band, and then he left to go somewhere, and then Ansel said to me, can you play a drum? I said, a little, and I went to start playing, and said, I like where you play. I said, really? And then, I remember, I mean, maybe around a couple of weeks after that, he come and said, I wanted to come and play a session for me. And the session was Night Doctor, and he, he sold it to the Upsetters. So it came out as the Upsetter, but that's what I wanted to produce the session and wrote the song. And you said, yeah, um, he asked you, you can play. And I know you're a very humble person. I said, so I, how I, well did he actually play? I don't know, but what, <laughs> what I was doing, he liked it, because he answers a drummer too, he plays drum. Yeah. I mean, from there on, um, that was when your career took off. When did you actually see that you would, you mentioned, um, you, you told your mom, how old were you at that age? Because at some uh, point you were doing... Like 12, 13. Uh, at that young age yeah. already? Yeah, 13. I think I was 12, 13 years old. I think about 12. Yeah, mom. Because in, in those times, you know, like, it's like Christmas comes very, very fast now. Like Christmas would take a long to come. So it, time was really slow. So everything take a long while, but no, I just been like wearing almost maybe coming to summer already and it's with us here to start. So in time that you wait, you wait on Christmas to come and it take a while. <laughs> Christmas come like it take five years to come. <laughs> now Christmas come in six months. So that was just a few years after Jamaican or also that it's independence. Yeah, Jamaica got how independence. was how were the vibes like then time? When in independence when I, I wasn't playing but I was listening to the music and there was like the band called the Scatalites and the drummer like names who were inspired me and people like Jackie me too were playing in the band and I used to look at them a lot and I like their music very much because of the attitude and the, the soulful way in which they played and you know? also I always vibe for the Scatalites because that was raw scare you know? it was under it was under to mm -hmm. so I learned a lot from these people mm -hmm. yeah one spot where a lot of musicians used to hang out was on Chancery Lane. Yeah, I used to hang out there too. I, exactly, yeah. I less rest. Tell I less me rest. a bit what you were doing there, how, well, what about it's like, what happened? I less rest is a place that a young producer, a musician, would go there and hang out and see if they can get any work. And the country people coming from country and they would come to buy a record. If you're a producer, you're making some record. Then you try to approach your country person say, but I have a new record, they want to hear it. And then you go inside the record shop and ask someone to play for you. If you if when they play the record, the country man love with you, so they'll give me six out and give me a box. So you, you make a sale. Sometimes you don't make any sale because 
the country by my know what song it came from. And Agnes was a place where we go to get jobs. So people want to do a session to come there to see musicians. I love that I know, spot like an office, you know, so you go mm -hmm. in and you punch no clock, but you have to punch the clock to go in and then that's it. And then you probably might leave on the corner like maybe four or five o'clock. When the day is done, you know, take a bus and go back home. And one of the studios that you went to work was Channel One? Channel One was the one that, because at the time I was playing in Red Hills in a band called um, R um, Skin Push and Bones. And I was playing in the band with me also, but they used to play in a band before called Staples, and then they came over. It was the same on Red Hills because there was a lot of nightclubs and a lot of live music. Yes, a lot there. of things going on, yes. So, um, so we actually used to go down to Channel One to do some sessions. I used to go down and play for a band. He said to Ernest and Joe that must let us come out there and play some rhythm for them. So we went out there and started playing some rhythm for them. We used to work and play some rhythm for ads on the Saturdays. And Jojo called a session. Um, I think the first song we cut was a song called It's a Shame by Deborah Wilson. And it was a big hit for them. And we started laying tracks to them. And Jojo called them the revolutionaries. And from there on, we just started making music. And Ernest and myself, Kind of work very hard to get the great drum sound that Channel One has, and when we think we got it right, then we said that is okay, and we start playing. And Jojo gave us a go ahead to just just make rhythms, just make the beats, and they were the stress point was they wanted the bass and drums to be tight. So mm -hmm. I was up to come with different jump pattern and jump, different jump beats. You know, they give me the freedom to do that, mm -hmm. and so that was a part of the Channel One sound, the bass and drums. You know? You mentioned to make the drums sound right, and you yeah. have a very, very specific sound. Yeah. You yeah. have a very low tuned snare drum. Yeah. Tell me, why did you come up with shaping your sound in a specific way? Was that to sound different from other Well, sound? I don't want it to sound different. I want to listen to a lot of R&B records. You know, I kind of like the snare drum sound. And I said, uh, when they become, they used to play in nightclubs. I was playing all of these R&B records, so I just listened to them a lot. I said, if I could get the sound, this could be my sound because most of the drummers in Jamaica, everybody had a sound for themselves. So I want to mm -hmm. shape a sound for myself. And I tried to figure out what the American was doing right there. The snare drum sound is so deep and, you know, very powerful. And we started figuring out and we started experimenting with Channel One with sound. And then we got it. We were trying to get the sound like early on drum from Philadelphia International, you know. and. We were as close to trying getting it, but um, we were satisfied with what we got. So I knew when I have this drum sound, I could do a lot of things on the drums. So when I got to say the thing that's with this, and then we still went to work mm -hmm. and started carving on beats and everything. And you mentioned different drum patterns as well. Yeah, and different drum the patterns, beat. different styles, yeah. Like if you, know, you look, if you listen to um, the Mighty Diamonds on um, right time come, you can hear a different jump style from everything that her body was playing. Because I was saying to myself, how can I get in, involved with this music? Because as a drummer, because there's so much great drummers in Jamaica. Yeah. So I have to figure a way out what I'm going to do. So <laughs> uh, what to do, we, we asked Ernest for some free time. Didn't have the money. And then I would do a song for myself. Ranch would do a song. Um, Doug it does some and answer their song and then I say, Ernest, I have a rhythm for you. So yeah, the rhythm we make was when the right time come rhythm and then the diamonds came in, wrote the rhythm, the song to the rhythm and the rest of the history. Mm -hmm. But this is a particular style that I played in right time. I added to my head, this is the ways I was going to play because I was listening to a lot of stuff that the record that was made by other people and I was taking the ideas and bringing it to reggae and mood to a friend of mine is so put a lot of parties in, 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 in Waterhouse. His name is Bobby, he's, he's dead now. So we used to walk and hum bass line and hum drum pattern while walking and figure out this is the way and you know, and there was a a, group, a, a song called Love Drones by a, a group called Brighter Shade of Darkness. When I heard the record, I heard the drum sound, I said, well, if I could get this drum sound into reggae, to the bass and we tried to get something close to that, you know. So would you actually then be in the studio and then tape the yeah, drum yeah, yeah, and just, and just try out? Or yeah, how, how would you actually go about We play it, record it, mm -hmm. listen back to it, put it on the dub plate. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a good kind of dub plate. I'll go back and play it on the sound and listen mm -hmm. to what it sounds like. I'll say, yeah, that is it. And then we know where it is. 
and I figured the business was kind of fast these days. You you had something, you had to cut it, you had well, to. Well, it, it was not. It was just, it was moving at a good pace. You know, you had enough time to do because you're still moving. So it's not fast like that because the technology like. Um, laptop computer wasn't involved with so it's the speed right. was reasonably there, so still over than around moderate not like now everything is moving so rapid you know that's true that's yeah. true that's true but was a lot of pressure on the people because um i mean i heard stories that channel one you used to spend like 12 hours there and then radix then came in and spent 12 hours and studio was yeah. just running running, just running. always run always run because sometimes we work there from 10 to 2 o'clock in the morning and sometimes we go back in the day, like when we were in Baltimore, we were there for one week, 24 hours, and then I would leave and go up to Joe Gibbs and play a session for Joe Gibbs, and then I would go down to Treasure Island. I was playing like sometimes 20 songs a day or more in that. A different producer, you know. And you never sleep? Yeah, I sleep, but uh, I was just thinking about the music still, you know. <laughs> and that, and you feed off from that energy rise yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. At some point, you and Robbie became also producers yourself, um, and you started with the taxi label. Yeah. What motivated that? Yeah, what motivated us um, to start recording for ourselves is like we're looking at the at the future, and what we were playing, we were playing it for producer, not ourselves. So all the style that I've played and the pattern I've played on Robbie bassline, in a sense, he does own it a little. He, he plays it right, but. Um, it's on another tape, and if the producer feel like taking off rubber bass, we could erase it, and nobody would hear it while we had played. So mm -hmm. we figure out that things we have to start owning some of the product ourselves. I mean, we're not gonna stop playing session, but we have to start owning some product because sooner or later we won't have anything, and if they don't want you to work no more for them, that's it. Mm -hmm. So I said we need to control ourselves, and we work when we want to work. And said that thing, and this is where we get we get um get going, you know, and then at the same time we were working with Peter Tosh and these things so we'd come from tour and then organization and Black Hole was there with us and we just keep on recording until we, we say we, we find a match and got to be going mm -hmm. right, you know. What was so special about Robbie and the way he played the bass? Because you played with many, we mentioned Ranchi, we Ranchi have and Lord Parks. Parks. Yeah, see, all, all, all of them are great bass players. Rand, um, Robbie love Alive Parks and Rachel very much and Jackie Jackson. And, but it's like from, for, for, for me, Robbie and myself was a team, became a team mm -hmm. when he asked me to, to come and join him with Peter Touch Band. So we used to trade off one another and suggest idea how we could do the music. And you know, he was suggesting to me, I suggesting to him. So we were just going on it and they had the rapid now, what do you call it now? And the cutting edge side of things instead of playing a normal thing. We played it. We played an album thing, but he would go outside and change the bass line and certain part of the song and everything. And he was trying different things, not to do the same thing. Like people before him were playing bass were doing it, but he respected these people so much, but he just wanted to be different. Mm -hmm. And same with me and the drums, I just tried to play different style, work on different patterns. So. Mm -hmm. so the spirit was to be different. You also ventured outside of reggae music and you work with and outside of Jamaican music. You work with um, artists like Joe Copper, for example, um, Serge Gansbourg and uh, Mick Jagger. People, uh, no doubt, for example, also other genres as well, pop, jazz, hip hop and so forth. That was also motivated by just being different. Yeah, yeah we, we, um, we used to listen to us we used to play all of these R&B songs and we just wanted to think if we all of these things were like experiment, you know, to think if we could play the R&B and we got it right. So we all tried to record and listen to the playback and say, oh, it sounds good. And we always um, just want to try things. And then um, we were playing Peter and then we decided to leave Peter with Peter's band. And then um, there's Gwen Gotri who used to do some backing vocals on Peter's album. And, we had spoken to her and asked her if she would come and do the lead vocal and this project we were doing and she said yes. And she loved Riga very much so we decided to go down and we're going to cut like I mean, something like an EP with her. Like. So Daryl, the guitar player, so played us on Black Rain and Peter Touch. It was a song called She Love In You and it was our first thing that was a kind of hit for her. And we would say wow we're getting involved with the American side of things and then. At the same time, being in Nassau, we're working on Grace Jones, 
a great soul yeah. music was like um it was reggae but it was reggae with a little difference to it you know like the mixture of everything like they had um they had this music in london called um i don't know what the music called they had, at the time with great soul but and so we kind of mixed up great soul because we kind of took the r&b part to our like like pull up to the bump on it to the bump like this song then at the same time Chris was producing Joe Cocker so we did Joe Cocker's album also and um and then we were working with Bill as well too at the same time too who to last to, to America work with Bill as well so there was a lot of things that went at the same time Steven Stanley were working at Tom Tom Club and created a song called Genius of Love so and that's how I was kind of bubbling you know with kind of kind of tropical song. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. And was that also because you personally enjoyed other music outside of reggae, or was yeah. it really to, to do something special in no, this? No, I, I I enjoyed it very much, and I listened to what they were doing because we wanted to reggae to have the impact inside of America or China. So you know we have to merge it at some point. And if you look like a double barrel. Now in the 70s, like 1970, 71, Double Barrel was number, the number one in England, was went to number 22 in America. And it's a basically a reggae sound, but there's some elements in it, I think, why, like, especially Dave Barker, Toast on the record, on the record and the kind of rhythm, it has a kind of funky thing to it, you know, so. We kind of work with the formula, what do you think the music would sound like to really work? You know, and it did work, so, but, I can guess a lot of people have tried it since, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's a formula. Yeah. It's the magic formula. <laughs> All right. How would you would you describe the vibes in the studio when you were, were working with Robbie? And um, you mentioned like you had the same spirit. How important is it to be working with someone that you also connect on well, a personal level? Thing, when, Robert, when Robbie goes in the studio, work, sometimes we don't know what they're going to do. I might start playing a drum part and then he start playing a bass line mm -hmm. and you say play plays and then the developer and I say, okay, play like this and I say, wow. And then we just tell the to work on it and then we can come we come back a little later and start working on it and development developing the um, the track, you know. Mm -hmm. So we used to try a lot of things, a lot of different things, you know. And is how how important is is the connection on a personal level when when working in the studio? Because I mean we it's work, so it's a workplace or when it's, when, it's, really when it's work, it ain't really, really it's you. I mean, it's serious and not serious. So we just work and, you know, we're just loose and just doing that and just, you know, not taking it like, oh, some people take it serious. But we're really serious, but we just casual with it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how were the vibes like when, when, when you work together? I mean, I can imagine you spending hours and hours in the studio together, right? Yeah, yeah, man. It was, it was always a good vibe, always yeah. a good vibe, because we were always going for the positive thing, you know? Yeah. And when you were also working with Black Uhuru, I mean, that was a, so to speak... Yeah, that was the magic, because um, they were like one of the, one kind of, a week, one of the vehicles for us, himself and Grace. A lot of artists were like a vehicle for us, so they kind of gave us the opportunity to really play with the sound that they were singing or so. We just did that and find the right groove for the rhythm. And the most important thing, like for the music today, we're not playing that kind of groove that would anchor down. I don't know. They don't know when they have that pocket, have that groove to just lock it. You know, like me and Robbie, I was trying to find that groove within and try and lock it. You know, and that's why I said this black boy song came out like this. Mm -hmm. I always play to support one another. And I mean, looking back now, it's been decades and. Um, whatever era it was you shaped it with your sound you left a trademark very specifically anyone can listen to the music and know this is like playing the drums was that something that you wanted to create and this is why you shaped yeah, the this, sound this, this like was, this this was something i wanted to create i wanted to create uh, my sound in the music you know just like call lightning that was a certain sound carlton bright that was a certain sound Winston Graham on the certain song, Paul Douglas as a song. I want I realize that the Santa as a song, I realized I have to try and find a song for myself. So this is why I went searching to find the right right beat, you know, the right song. So how would you react when you when you get it and you were like, Oh yeah, that's it. Yeah, when we got it, when we got it, we knew we had it, you know, so we went from from record at the right time. 
Mm-hmm. From, it's a shame, you know, we had it and then we start working on it to get it better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So is it it's a steady development of the Yeah, music? steady development, yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, what music do you listen to when you don't have to work? I listen to everything, everything, everything. everything. Reggae, rock, steady, uh, some jazz, sometimes R&B, funky, hip hop, everything. And you can just lean back and not listen to yeah, the drum yeah, pattern alone. Yeah, that's I always, as a drummer, I always find the pattern first. Okay. <laughs> I listen to everything in a record still, but I always can pick up what the drummer is playing first and check it out, and I could even say, "Wow, well, I could play this a different way, and it sounds mm-hmm. good too." You know, so, mm-hmm. well, I listen to what the drummer is playing. Oh, wonderful! I mean, you have influenced, inspired, and and. I mean, brought so much joy to so many reggae fans around the globe and also to fellow producers and musicians. You're aware of, I mean, you you are an icon. You inspire people. <laughs> I, don't so, know I know you're icon. so humble. You know, <laughs> this is what I, ha- <laughs> I want to tell you now, you know. Because you've touched so many people. All right, my, my, my thing in life is I like to see people happy. I like to see people smiling. I, I think through the music, I want to see people dancing because when you are playing music and people are dancing, so I try to find a bright beat to make people have to move. And I like to see people smile and being happy. I'm trying to use music to make people can forget the problem for even for just three minutes, you mm-hmm. know, have a length of the song. Yeah, man, you have. So, so that's what I work on to try and tap into people's brain, you know. Yeah, man, you have been successfully doing that for decades. Well, I'm trying. I hope I can keep on doing it, you know. Yeah, man, that's what I wanted to ask now, now that they Sadly, yeah. one half of the Rhythm Twins has gone someplace else. How did you feel about that when you heard yeah, it? I really feel how uh, when he died. I really feel it was like a knockout punch, you know? Mm-hmm. But then you have to kind of say, this is reality, you have to face it. So I decided that, you know, talking and looking back at the music, you kind of miss him, miss him now because there were some things that, you know, you, you want to work on. And he was always there. We were always there for one another. So, but, He's not there now, so I have to try a different route and outside the work, mm-hmm. you know. But I think it's gonna work because um people like Live Parts and Chris Meredith and all the bits player and Glenn Brown and we're coming in and tripping and um uh, even Robert didn't play the bass sometimes a keyboard or Lanky oh, okay. or Bubbler, you know. Alright. So they're right. fitting. So I, I I'm cool but Robbie was just a different thinking person when it comes to music, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So at the same time, you can carry on the legacy and you can still carry Yeah, yeah, you have to carry, you have to carry the legacy and the work, same way, you know? Yeah, man, yeah, man. Yeah. So you're going to be working on new music? Uh, yeah, man, oh, I never stop, never stop never working. Stop. Yeah, never stop working because we're working on a new album now called Red is Old, part volume two. And we are doing a song that Robbie uh, played the bass on and we're going to cover it. And just to keep Sly and Robbie name out there, uh-huh. so it's going to be Sly and Robbie, yeah. And are there still recordings of you and Robbie that are on release? Like, yeah, 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 some stuff like that. Like how, how much? I don't know, because sometimes we never come to just play them. Yeah, exactly, them. Yeah. I can imagine. I mean, yeah. you probably have like this full of. Yeah, so. Cause we have two, a couple of new songs coming out with Archive, is what we're, we're experimenting with just coming up, coming up now. All right. Great. So we have something that we can look forward to yeah man and then, as i said there's uh, this album coming yeah. and there's i think two singles coming and one peter is singing and one day it's gonna be like an instrumental stuff and working on other things and sharing is gonna do some backing vocal and then maybe some vocal lead in it wonderful yeah that's calling light parts but uh be involved in it wow yeah. nice so this is basically some but documenting history all over yeah, again yeah because all of us all of us used to play on radio as well yeah exactly and, and so, so trace nothing. back yeah trace way way back also yeah. in your personal history yeah. that you just mentioned yeah so we're gonna go back to radio as a volume two volume one is out there yeah. i don't know if we have a copy of it i can get the copy yeah 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 wonderful i mean from? isn't that amazing that how many years has it been that you worked with Ansel and the first time and yeah, with, and with still, Lloyd still as well? Yeah, still talk to one, to one and every day, they, they have life parts, you still buy one. Could you have imagined time. that after all these years you all still be there? No. No. I can get one of the albums for you, one for yourself and one for Alex. So Thank you, you so have your separate much. one, Alex has this. Thank you so much, yeah. I really, really appreciate it.